Jessica, CEO and founder of Lead Position here, coming to you every Sunday at 10 a.m. live, uh, sometimes recorded, but mostly live. And today I have a special guest. Usually I do not have physicians who uh, a non-physician on with me today, but today I'm so happy and grateful to have Mark Hurtling. He's the uh, former Lieutenant General serving 38 years in the U.S. Army. Uh, he ended his career as the commander of Army Forces in Germany. And since, since 2013, he served with major healthcare organizations. He developed a successful interprofessional healthcare leaders course for doctors, nurses, and administrators. And his research on the course was the basis for his book, which is called Growing Physician Leaders. And his recent uh, doctoral dissertation, which hopefully I'll talk to uh, him about that later on physician leadership design. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for being here with me today. It is an honor to be with you, Dr. Ko. I really appreciate you asking me to come on with you. And especially knowing now that I'm the only non-physician you've had, that's, that's a great honor. I'll try yeah, not I, to mess it up. <laughs> well, I mean, how could I not ask you, somebody who's been so passionate about leadership, uh, especially, I mean, all healthcare leaders, but especially for physician, why is that? And just tell us a little bit about how you got involved in physician leadership. I am glad you used the word passion because frankly, I've used that word about three times over the last two days talking about this new um, part of my life that I've become involved in. Um, you know, I left the military, retired after 38 years, as you said, in 2013, and uh, was recruited by a healthcare organization to do a, another initiative. And I won't go into that because it's too complicated. They were looking to establish a way to bring global partnering with other uh, hospitals or, uh, around the, the, the world to, to get some new ideas about how to treat US patients. But by happenstance, my office mate, my next door Carol mate was a guy by the name of Dr. Dave Moorhead. Uh, and he was our organization's chief uh, uh, medical officer. Well, he would come in and every once in a while ask me questions about leadership and how uh, you know, they were trying to bring physicians more to the table uh, and get their ideas. But there, was, there were some people that were adamantly against that. And, and as we talked about leadership, he said, you know, we've been uh, contracting and consulting with a bunch of different firms and universities to try and improve our leader development program. And here we've got a guy like you that's been leading all his life. Would you be interested in putting together a program for us. I hesitated a minute and, and he said something which I now have never forgotten, which is uh, it kind of rushed over me at the time. He said, this will be a part-time job for you, but it will potentially be the most important work you'll ever do. And that, that turned out to be chills. right. That just gave me chills, go ahead. Yeah, and, and it turned out to be right. And, and truthfully, you know, I put together a course based on what I had learned in the military using uh, our military doctrinal manual as a base. Uh, there's much more to the story where he asked me to do that, but I won't go into that. And so I took the elements of one profession, the military, and applied them to another profession, medicine, and it seemed to work. Uh, and, and it was all based on the fact that physicians, for the most part, and Dr. Moorhead told me this, he said, you know, physicians never learn leadership. And in fact, as I described how the military approaches the teaching of leadership, he said, you know, that's exactly the opposite of what we do in med school. Whatever leadership most people have in them, med school beats it out of them to, to try and make, their, make them singularly focused as opposed to team focused. So as we designed not only what was going to be taught and discussed in these series of seminars, but also the way we were doing it, we decided to make it an interprofessional course. Now, Dr. Coe, I didn't know what interprofessional was at that time, and they never mentioned that word, but I've since uh, learned how that's something the AMA says we should be doing with, with physician leadership. And that is bringing teams of physicians, nurses, and administrators together to teach them how to lead their organization, lead their community, and their patients in different ways. So for the last six years, I've been teaching that course, um, you know, one course a year, sometimes two, uh, depending as a part-time job. And as I figured out- During your retirement. <laughs> in my and enjoying retirement, but yeah. uh, it was with the other duties I had at our healthcare system. 
But over the last two years, I decided I wanted to shun those other responsibilities and focus on physician leadership. And at the same time, learn more about um, the, the theory uh, and approaches to leadership. So that's where I got enrolled in a doctoral program and, and did all that. But yeah. that's a very long story and I'm talking too much. So I'll, no, uh, it's okay. I'll stop you know, there. Since, since you brought up that that point about uh, physicians never getting leadership training, which, which is absolutely, sounds like you've, you, you've immersed yourself in our culture so much, you understand a lot, I mean, six years of doing this. But there was one uh, particular, I just wanna read a little piece of your book, if you don't mind, on page 83, which is, uh, and um, you know, I highly recommend anyone who's interested in leadership to, to buy this book, Growing Physician Leaders. Uh, but on page 83, it says, while most generals receive training specifically designed to put their egos in check, and some don't do so well in that training, few physicians get such training. We school them to believe they have the right answer, the right diagnosis, the right approach, and the right prescription for every medical situation. In most cases, they really do have the correct answers. Doctors are, after all, experts in the human body and in medicine. And then you later go on to talk about how they, how a physician may fail to find the information needed from the person they're, they're talking to the patient. And some may call this, some may chalk this up to poor bedside manner or poor leadership. Uh, and the inability of a patient to lead as defined by understanding another's motivations and then using the correct influence techniques to accomplish some stated objective might contribute to a patient's extended hospital stays in proper care, incorrect use of prescribed medicine and excessive repeat visits to emergency department. Can you talk to us a little bit about that or what do you, I mean, I think that's, you nailed it right there. That's exactly, I mean, I have that personal story of, of not really understanding my ability to lead as a physician, which then translated into my administrative roles. Well, you, you know, Dr. Koh, it's interesting because when, when, if you were to ask anyone to, to describe a leader to you, they would come up with all these qualities and attributes. And there's, there's a mental picture of someone out front uh, gathering the hordes together and having them do what they want them to do. And, and certainly that is a description of leadership, but another one has to do with, and, and as you go into the research, you find that leadership is made up of the individual who is the leader, their attributes, their competencies, what they can do, the influence methods they apply, and the situation they find themselves in. So this is really a four-dimensional approach to ensuring other people are able to accomplish what we call in the military, the mission, or uh, obtain the objective we're looking for. Whether it, it's a patient uh, helping the physician and the nurse fight their disease, or it's the hospital system. But anyway, it, 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 it takes all of those factors of attributes, competencies, influence methods, and an understanding of the environment or the situation to determine who can really lead. You know, as, as a military commander, I've been thrown into different situations uh, where I had to apply different techniques, different influence methods to get people to do what we needed them to do, uh, environments that were totally different and, and required uh, various approaches. So all of those things play a part. Um, and, and I think that's what we describe in the course and the light turns on for most of our attendees where they realize that there isn't a one size fits all uh, to approaching leadership requirements. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about, and one of my favorite chapters in, in your book, and I, I liked a, a lot of favorite chapters in your book, but oh, the one about you. Gettysburg. You yeah. took a group of physicians to Gettysburg. Why did you do that? And then, and there's all these quotes of what, of feedback of people, I think you assigned each, you know, person, a physician or a healthcare right. worker, a role, and then they came back with feedback on their role in the, in the Gettysburg uh, address. Yeah, in, in, each, in each class, we have a total of 50 people. Uh, they're all volunteers, uh, and it usually consists of 35 physicians of all specialties, 10 nurses, and five administrators. And we do that specifically to have crosstalk. 
But this Gettysburg, what the military calls a staff ride, becomes a capstone event at the end of the course. And everything they, they learn through the 40 hours of seminar, we have uh, one five hour seminar per month for a total of eight months. Uh, we kind of bring out a real live example in a crisis situation, the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. And we assign each participant of the course a character from the battle. We don't expect them to become button collector historians or Civil War experts. We just ask them to learn a little bit about the personalities of the individuals that we ask them uh, to study uh, before we go up there. Then we go to the spot on the battlefield where those different people had different actions and we spend an entire day and a half up there. And we say, okay, how did that person's personality and that person's approach to leading and communicating and influencing and his personality, how does it contribute to success or failure? And through those uh, vignettes of the different battlefield characters, uh, the 50 of them that we assign, a, a lot of things are brought out like personalities matter, communication is critical. Influence methods apply differently in different situations. Uh, gaining the trust of your subordinates is key. How you communicate is important uh, given the situation. What contributes to someone being a toxic leader? How does an informal leader contribute to the formal organization? I mean, I can, I can go down all of the lessons that we really try and drive home on the battlefield, but it makes the things we discuss in those seminars that we had conducted over the previous months come alive. And at the end of each session, you know, I, I, we, we have a historian who really paints the picture and then we allow the, the, the participants to talk about their character in a very unique way. And it's a lot of fun. But what my job is during that battle, because I know both the battle and I know the, the, the physicians, what I then do is pull out of them how those lessons that they're talking about in 1863 apply today in modern healthcare. Yep. And you are in a battlefield. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, exactly. And more so a battlefield now than you've ever been on before. Yeah, because so those we lessons know what's are going to happen next. Exactly. Yeah, it, this is crisis leadership uh, given the pandemic. So yeah. that's a whole different scenario uh, right. that we have not yet talked about on the battlefield of Gettysburg because we haven't been there since the pandemic started. But I'm sure we're going to have a whole lot more understanding of how to lead during a crisis. Right. Uh, but but you all as physicians are leading in a crisis every single day, even when there's not uh, a pandemic approach. You know what? I also uh, really hit hit uh, home to me in, in this chapter was uh, you talked about how people were, you know, when somebody was not able to lead and someone else had to step up and it's all of a sudden like, oh, my God, I'm not really ready. How am I going to do this? That's exactly who we are as physicians. We need to have our ducks in a row in order to step up. And many of us have a fear of like, oh my God, I didn't really study this. I didn't take an exam. I'm not really prepared. And we have to change our mindset and saying, you know, I don't need to know everything. I'll figure it out. One well, of my uh, previous interviewees, interviewee said, it's all figure outable. Yeah, it is. Um, and one person was a college professor turned into a general, I believe. Um, Let's see here. So, oh, oh, Colonel Chamberlain. Here's the guy. This is a this is the feedback from one doctor. Here's the guy who is a college professor before the war starts. He doesn't know anything about soldiering, and now he's in a critical position where he has to lead his soldiers and make tough decisions. It struck me that he admitted to himself he didn't know everything, but he was constantly trying to learn new things about his role, about tactics, about his people. He realized his people wanted him to succeed because of the person he was. They wanted to be associated with him because of his values, his attributes and how he cared for them and how he was focused on the mission. And they just liked being around him. He had the right approach in a new position. He brought it, the team in, he showed them he was genuine. He had the right vision for the organization and he communicated that vision continuously. Yeah, yeah Joshua Chamberlain, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain led the the main regiment, and he is one of the favorites because he's the focus of a book called Killer Angels, uh, but he's also the focus of a movie about Gettysburg. Um, need to watch that. Yeah. yeah, so so the the doctors all want, you know, we ask for volunteers to play different parts and everybody wants to play Chamberlain. What they soon find out is 
Chamberlain is just one of many like that. But yes, he was a college professor in, in Bowdoin, Maine, at Bowdoin College in Maine. Oh, nice and, school. And yep. and uh, he he became he actually won the Medal of Honor at Gettysburg, and then later became a two-star general and accepted Lee. Or I'm sorry, Grant gave him the honor of accepting Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. So wow. he was one of the very few that were not West Point graduates, and yet. He studied and looked at leadership, looked at learned tactics, and uh, the physicians all really like that character, but they soon find there are many more just like him on that battlefield. And they teach the lessons that you just talked about. And if I can, the, the point you made about teaching uh, and, and stepping up, you know, there's a lot of folks who are looking for mentors to help them along the way. And what we tell our physicians in the course is, hey, you not only have to look for the mentor, you have to be the mentor to someone else. You have to determine who within your circle of colleagues are the ones that you wanna spend a little extra time with to develop, to teach, to train, and to help them come along. Because one of the requirements, one of the responsibilities of leadership is actually to grow your replacement. And we don't do that very well in healthcare, we do we? we do uh, not. So that's one of the things that, that we push hard on this course. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you uh, for everyone watching. Mark, how can we reach out to you if, if somebody had a question or you know are interested in the services that you give? Yeah, well, uh, my email address is mphertling75 at gmail. Uh, I'm on Twitter um, at, at Mark Hurtling. And uh, I'd be happy to try and provide any answers that your listeners might have. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And, and um, again, thank you for your services. And um, we really appreciate you helping us have the country that we have, the freedom that we have. Oh, well, thank all you so much. People like and you. Thank you. And for all you, the healthcare providers that are doing so much service uh, to the nation today as well. It's an yeah. honor to be a part of all of this. Thank you. And um, I look forward to talking to you more about uh, what you're doing with physician leadership. We really appreciate it. We need that in this country. And uh, thank God for someone like you. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Right. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye.